So welcome to Cerulean Arts, uh, to the tour and talk for the current collective exhibition on view through March 12th. And it features the work of Leslie Fenton, Caroline Fur, Fran Gallen, Susan Leshnoff, and Susan Sullivan. So I uh, hope you can see the show. Everything's also available on our website. Uh, and you can see all the work there as well. So I'm going to spotlight Tina's video. So we're going to march through the each person's exhibition and they, each artist will speak uh, about uh, themselves and their work. Mm, that's good. And the first artist we come to is Caroline Fur. Hi, Caroline. Yes. Um... My, it's very dim over there, isn't it? <laughs> We're getting closer. Getting closer. The one on the left is a midnight shot, so there we have it. You might think it's a rock outcropping, but if you look closely and read the label, it says alligator and odalesque. And you see the alligator. <laughs> all, of my, all of my pieces have things in them. This is... Resting cloud. I use a lot of um, I use a lot of shrubs. I use a lot of mazes. There are several people here. On the mid right is even a lit standing lamp. A cloud can stop. There it is. A cloud can stop when they see something interesting and take their time. So this is. This is my imagining what a cloud would be looking at and what a cloud would be feeling. In the gallery, I think we're going in there now, are more of these landscapes. Most of them have a lot of hidden imagery in them. Sometimes you don't even see it until it's pointed out to you. I'm not gonna do that with everyone because that would just be boring. This is Rhonda, the birthplace of bullfighting. And someone the other day said, all this looks very much like sheep. It's not, but I have no problem with people seeing things in my work. If it's sheep, so be it. These pieces are all 12 by 16, relatively small for me. Ah. Here's something that you don't see anything. And then, Tina, go in on that little bug. <laughs> so there's this kind of thing about, that's a praying mantis. I've been painting for decades. And um, I've always painted in oil, but when I started doing some surface design several years back, I had to learn how to paint in casein and gouache, which I found out that I liked a lot better than oils, and in many ways, it's less toxic. Here's Park La Brea. That's a place in um, Los Angeles. The one in the middle is another is another piece called tree passes by. And you know that this is a tree passing by because it's wearing a shoe. And in, on the interior, there's a horse's head, a couple of, I think you can see, once you get into it, there's a lot of pen and ink and oh, porpoises and just general things. I think there's a, we're coming up on a bird. So this, my idea basically is something of fantasy and um, you want to live with art and you also want to be surprised by it every once in a while. So while I'm spilling my guts and telling you where all my hidden imagery is, there's still things to see. There are a lot of aerial things this time. I, here are these, here are these letters again. Um, you can really get in there, can't you, Tina? Jeez. Oh, a, a dog and a dog shadow. Well, I think you get the, get the drift. These are just things you get involved with when you're painting and you just let it, let your mind go. 
And then at a certain point, when enough paint gets on there, the paint starts speaking back to you. I think any painter knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's not crazy at all. So Caroline, when you say mixed media, what, uh, what is it? Well, I have, I have, I have latex paint. I have ink. I have, sometimes I use, um, actually, this is a, a secret. I'll just blurt it out. Sometimes I use fingernail polish. It's a lacquer. You can just hit certain things and, and, and it pops. So I use what's at hand. Uh, so these are not completely water-based. But I've been doing this back and forth thing enough where they don't crack or fall apart. This is a this is a woman here. She's on a pedestal. She's the lady of the house, but the house is on fire, so she's out of there. Um, sometimes I will make comments about relationships or politics or all kinds of things. This is very simple, really, very simple. It's It pretty much says it like it is. Here is something called the way home. There, This person is trying to get home and it's not gonna be easy. It's not going to be easy at all. Oftentimes I'll put small things, uh, here we think we're coming up on a goat. Yes, right there. The goat made it, but this, man, if you want to call him that, may not. I will stay with this work for a while because I stay, I, I will stay with this small format. Aha, this is called shoals. I love the word shoals. Really, it's just a sandbar. But if you come up here in the far left, you do see some things. There's a dinosaur, a very small dinosaur far away. These paintings should be not scary. I hope no one is frightened. Um, they, they should be the kind of thing that you can live with for a long time. And then all of a sudden, see something you never saw before. That's kind of my aim with these, these, these smaller paintings. Caroline, your uh, style seems to have a drawing, strong drawing aspect to it, like a calc. Yes. Line. Yes. You talk about that. Yeah, I always um I'm the kind of person that starts out with a lot of drawings and a lot of a lot of plans. And I have never once been able to actually execute those things where they look like the drawing. But it does I I want to keep the drawing. So you'll see a lot of drawing, and I I I never like to get rid of everything. I want every little mark to show. Of course, that's not always possible. But you see kind of where I'm going with this. And this is drawing over paint, too. This is the Vatican Garden. I painted this garden probably seven or eight times. And here you see in the Vatican Garden, there are lots of dead bodies and, and hidden bodies. You just, you know it. It's where these kind of things happen. Here is Hokusai's wave. Hokusai's famous wave, and this is called Rogue Wave in Hampton Court. There's surrealism here. There are no faces in this or animals to be seen, so don't force yourself on this one. I like to take things from other people. I think when you start painting, I remember when I first started painting, you copied. You copied all the, all the masters. And it's still the best thing. When you're stuck and you're in a rut and you don't know what to do, just pull off somebody else's work. So where did you learn to paint? Huh. All the schools that I have been to, you want to know that? Yes. Cal State Fullerton mainly. That's where that's where my undergrad and my grad work was done. So you're from California? No, originally I'm from Oklahoma, then Texas, then California, then Barcelona, and now Philadelphia. I did not really learn how to paint in Oklahoma or Texas, but I painted while I was there. There, there are a lot of people here. This is called free ride. So these people in this water are either going to be swept over the side or swirl down in that round whirlpool. This is a painting about 
probably death. <laughs> probably. Most likely. So I don't, I don't think I have anything else to say about this work. I feel that my work is clear. It's titled, it's figurative. I think that pretty much gets your point across one way or the other. Tina, thank you for zooming in on the important parts. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Caroline. And next we come to the work of Susan Leshnoff. Hi, Susan. Hi. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about my work. Um, anybody who's been to the exhibit or is thinking about it will easily realize that my main focus is landscape, uh, especially skies and well, a lot about trees as well. My earliest memories are of enjoying the outside. Uh, but when I think about the outside, it always has to do with um, the light, the heat, the wind, the rustling of the trees, um, the fact that nothing stays still in nature. And that's what I love to capture. Here are um, some paintings of um, my uh, fixation with the sky, which has gone back since I was a little girl. And I, I think I found the sky and clouds more interesting than anything else that was in the suburb where I grew up, except the park. And I try to uh, capture a feeling of spirit in my nature studies and my paintings, because it's through nature that there is a passageway to the spiritual world. I'm basically a very spiritual person and I try to make my landscapes transcend the actual details to a level where people will be moved to realize that um, this is part of a more than a universe that we can really grasp. And that uh, through my painting, I try to uh, provoke a sense of peace and uh, that uh, nature can provide when it transcends itself. In this particular painting uh, of just a bouquet, uh, instead of focusing on the individual flowers, there's a feeling here of just the animation of flowers. People ask me how I do it. And this is a mixed media uh, uh, product in which I'm using uh, Winter Newton watercolor markers I'm using a calligraphic pen and I'm using uh, watercolors. The order, which some people are interested in, has, uh, is usually linear first, and then I move into watercolor and it's lots of layers. The painting on the left is called I See Rhythm in the Trees. And what I'm trying to capture there is, is exactly that, that when the wind blows, uh, the, there is a force that although it seems like chaos has a certain type of um, rhythm, uh, which is uh, part of uh, physical nature. And um, I love that. I, um, I've been um, ensconced with uh, and preoccupied with uh, trying to capture the rustling of leaves in trees. And I work pretty hard on that. In this particular uh, work, which you're focusing on, you can see that I've had a lot of experience using line and I'm using a calligraphy pen. And um, I have done a lot of calligraphy in both English and Hebrew. And without my even realizing it, in the lower part of the ground, there are a lot of Hebrew letters that just emerge because I'm so used to twisting that pen around uh, in English, uh, in in English letters or Hebrew letters, and um, and and there's a feeling. I have a great feeling for line, and it's very important for me 
to include a variety of directions that the lines go, thicknesses that the lines have, and a, and a type of twisting so that there's no such thing, so that there's not a, a purpose in creating lines that are all similar. And so as you look through my paintings, there is, you'll see that one of the things that I've always done is to try to capture those aspects of nature that are very often uh, looked over. Um, not the tourist destinations, but all those places that you walk by. Uh, this one uh, specifically has to do with the Brandywine River, uh, the Brandywine Canal, but, but that is, um, that, that this one is a little bit more focused. Some people ask, well, how do you start? And yes, I'm um, inspired by photographs. I can't help but take photographs wherever I am if I'm outside. And I'm lucky that there's such a thing as a digital, a digital camera or my phone because it makes it so much easier. And uh, I um, like to capture that sense of wild nature or untamed nature. This, is, this particular painting does focus upon that aspect. Other uh, ways of painting have to do with the temperature of the paper. I go from wet to damp to dry, and I work in layers. These particular paintings are acrylics, but still the same kind of feeling there. Um, the one on the left is just, is just a field, a flat field, and it can be anywhere and a sky with some, with some clouds in it, but there's something about it that almost looks tangible. There's something about it which makes you want to go and explore the field and, at the, and, and through your exploration to somehow connect with a spiritual world. That's very important to me, connecting with the spiritual world and my paintings providing a sense of peace, um, a sense of, of energy, uh, that is a part of the natural experience. In this particular painting, which you're looking at, um, again, it has a feeling of great distance, but there's also a feeling there that it's alive, that there's wind, that there's movement of the trees, and yet there's still a stillness there that allows you to, uh, to in a sense, vicariously stand there and to experience a sense of wilderness that will make you feel part of um, the, um, the greater universe and uh, to the mystical world itself. I'm just waiting to see what else you're gonna show. Oh, this one, the, um, the painting over to the left is kind of important because it has to do with the configuration of a grove of trees. And here is another aspect of how I paint. Um, I can start out with a photograph, but then it goes off because it becomes a canvas. It has particular dimensions. It's flat. Nature is not flat. And uh, what a, it, it's constructed with a sense of design, a sense of composition, and a sense of balance. And this particular painting um, has a little bit more of that a need to, uh, to do a careful construction that has a type of harmony and balance that makes it a painting that uh, references the beauty of this natural world. And these are some of my larger paintings. And I actually call this one Breathe. And there's another one, uh, I think a Tina, yeah, Tina backs up. She can, you can see both of them. There are 36 inches square. And although you can't see the colors that well, um, unlike some of my other paintings, the sky is um, multi-layered. In this particular one, there's a beautiful type of violet that seems to float in as well as other colors. But what I'm trying to capture here is that feeling of great space and a sense of light, which allows you to breathe freely and to feel good about being part of this natural world. I also, um, because there's so much emphasis upon the digital experience, emphasize in many of my paintings, my natural brush strokes and the natural application of paint. So that unlike anything which has a, a, a digital, re that, that is based upon a digital image is not part of what I am painting. 
this is called a multicolored sky. And thanks, shall I say thanks in a very crude way to all the pollution that we have in this world. The sky has become so colorful. And um, unfortunately, that's part of our world, but there are places in this world where you see these, where you still see these beautiful sunsets that have nothing to do with pollution. So uh, th this one just pulled Capri, and it, it's an aerial view of um, a, a beautiful coastline. So Susan, you paint in both acrylic and watercolor. Yes, I do. How do you decide what to, when to switch back and forth? I can't do both at the same time. And I either uh, choose um, watercolor for a while or, um, or acrylic paint. I do have an issue. It can take me a very long time until I find that a painting is resolved. In other words, that I, I've created something which I can live with that is well composed. And until I get to that point, it can be extremely painful. And it can take quite a while until, until I actually can breathe freely and say that the painting is working. Here's a, another one of, it's called Aqua Sky. And uh, again, you know, some of my fixation with uh, looking at the clouds and, and thinking about, um, thinking about religion. There's a great emphasis in my paintings on space and light. And the big painting over to the left, you can see that there is a sun that's partially hidden in uh, the light source. This particular painting that you're looking at now is actually 36 inches wide and 12 inches high. It took me the longest time to get those clouds right. When you're looking at that painting, you don't feel that those clouds are, are, are being contained by the edges of the canvas, but rather that they can go on forever. That was so difficult to do, to create a landscape that worked with the dimensions of um, the a canvas as well as uh, what I was trying to uh, capture, which is the vastness of land. And again, it's unexplored land. It's land that hasn't been touched too much by a human uh, hands. And then with these watercolors that you see, these trio of watercolors are a few of the many that I have that are a combination of, again, the Windsor Newton watercolor markers, uh, watercolor paints and uh, the a calligraphic pen, which I have been talking about. And if any of you are interested in uh, learning about how to use these pens, the one caution that I have is make sure that it's light fast. Because when I started painting and doing a lot of drawing with calligraphy pens, one year later, I would find out that my black marks were either purple or brown because it wasn't light fast. So th this, this one has to do more about a garden or a bouquet. Uh, I love um, botanical art, but I have to do it in my own way. And uh, you'll see in, in my paintings that there's a great number of directions that my hands move and a great a variety of marks. Um, it's a conscious effort to uh, develop all of those ways of moving my hand and my fingers. So in, in this particular painting, you can see that there are areas that were wet or damp, and I've applied the paint to it and other areas where it is dry. And um, very often I will do, in, well, in this particular one, I won't say very often, in this particular painting, I have done the watercolor and then I've added lines to it, but there are lines behind it and um, it's created in various layers. And this is the, uh, I think this is the last painting that you would be seeing. And it is an aerial view of a great big wide open space with a cloud that um, looks stormy and um, a great sense of distance and a uh, perspective and uh, carefully rendered colors that, um, that are varied and uh, that um, create, help to create the sense of space. So I'm working on creating space through the use of color and how uh, they um, they act they are activated um, spatially themselves because some colors project more than other colors. I'm working with aerial space 
uh, which is space of atmosphere, and there's also perspective space. And of course, there's also space that is uh, created by a changing scale. So that's my show. And I think I told you quite a bit about it. Mm -hmm. Hope that you enjoyed what I had to say. Thank you, Susan. And next we come to Fran Gallen's exhibit. Hi, Fran. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's really wonderful to see so many people. And uh, uh, thanks to Tina and Mike and the amazing job they do hanging. It's a joy to see uh, the work up and translated into their mm, uh, vision. So this, this one that you're looking at now is um, uh, mixed media that uh, from a real vase of flowers, which, um, uh, and I'll say more about this too, is something that I haven't really done in many, many decades uh, to work from life. But of course it's um, a bit, it's uh, not ex totally realistic. It's, uh, has the feeling of what what was there uh, um, and of course it's a lot about color that's a big part of what I do uh, so going in inside the gallery space now um, so this is a big painting 50 by 60 and uh, those that were maybe at the last show may recall that I'm all these big canvases are being painted over now. And I'm using mixed media and collage on top of the paint. So this, that <laughs> that's, that's fun to see it like that. Um, those flowers were cut from another watercolor uh, and inserted and <laughs> glued onto that vase. And there's also um, a little piece of newspaper that has flowers on it, roses that, that got in there too. And the, this is collage, as you can see from close up. Uh, the shapes, this is kind of my, these are my characters, these shapes, these vases, um, and these are all made up. I'm not looking at a still life. Years and years ago in the 80s, I did, and that's what's underneath a lot of these is the old paintings. Uh, I'm not painting over everything because some of them are some of them can still exist, but a lot of them have really experienced the big upgrade. So, <laughs> um, right, that one is called uh, "Still Life with Planets," and that refers to the to the big floating orbs in the background. Now, here we have an original old one from, believe it or not, 1987. <laughs> and it was in the lineup to get painted over. Um, it's small, and it I just I just became very fond of it, and I didn't want to paint over it. So it it lives on. And this I used it as a material as an idea for two other collages you'll see on the other on the other wall. So remember, little bottle there on the table with some simple things on either side um, and a, a band, a darker band going across the top. Um, so uh, the, uh, the last years I have gotten back to still life and interiors, which initially was um, scary because I had done still life exclusively and lovingly until it wasn't loving anymore in the 80s. And I switched to mixed media and work on paper. But getting back to it has been a lot of fun because I'm riffing on it. I feel like I'm um, playing with still life. And well, I am. I, I mean, that's exactly what I'm doing. So this is called uh, a Quiet Evening at Home. And it's a little interior with um, the pictures of the family on the wall. and the old TV and uh, a lot of it is collage. Some of it is paint. Well, a lot of it is paint. <laughs> um, 
and some objects in the room. And someone <laughs> pointed out to me that the TV is not plugged in, <laughs> which makes me laugh. But um, <laughs> maybe that go, maybe that works too. Uh, this this jolly little fellow, um, it's very small. It's like uh, five by three by five, really small, or five by seven. Uh, watercolor mixed media using a lot of India ink in in the pen with a metal nib that I really enjoy. Um, this one also take off on the characters, all the flowers. Uh, the last couple years, I've I've reconnected with cone flowers. I used to paint them a lot um, in Jimmy Luter's class in the summer. Uh, from his garden. Um, yeah, so I, I painted, uh, well, I went to PCA and studied photography, but always painted, and then it just kind of got more and more. It's painting, painting, and mixed media. Mixed media really saved my life, but, <laughs> uh, and now I use a lot of paint. This, this one's called meditation, or COVID meditation. That's what it's called, COVID meditation, and it's from 2020. Um, and the the bands, the strata, so to speak, has been a, a big motif in my work for a long time. And before the shapes, the vessels and the, the characters, as I call them, re-entered my work, it was all this imaginary landscape with a lot of layers that, that this harkens back to, uh, that one. Um, yeah, so there's uh, another big painting that's called uh, At Home with Friends. And if you may see the, the little friends, uh, Tina comes in closer. There's the kitty cat um, that appeared. Uh, it's been scraping off some of the color on the bottom there at one point, and I stepped I stepped back to take a look and uh, I said, oh my gosh, there's a cat. And there's the dog. <laughs> the dog I helped along a little bit more than the cat, but the cat was like fully formed. Um, and these made up vases and collage pieces. Again, these are cut from another uh, drawing that I did that um, I love to cut up old work. A lot of, a lot of, all of this uh, is old work, including the rug in in this room uh, that some of you might recognize from the, there's the rug, um, from many years of doing these narrow bands. And all of that is, is cut up old work. And then that was cut up. <laughs> that was on a bigger piece, say something like this. Each of those are slightly different and they got cut up and combined into uh, the rug with its painted painted fringe. So Fringer. all the shapes are wacky and yeah, sorry. I was gonna just ask about your color and like using almost fields of color. Like what, uh, can you speak about that a little bit? Especially the vibrancy of your colors? It, it, um, it just seems to come uh, naturally. It's really like you can see my my badge, my color wheel badge. Um, that's kind of where I want to be. It, it's uh, oh, that's old work. Yeah, um, I'll say a little bit more about that. But this is this is one. There's collage on top of paint, and this is one uh, that is a referencing the little bottle that's on the other wall. You can see that mm, basic uh, composition, that chair on the left, half a chair that you see, and there's the center kind of uh, growing thing. <laughs> uh, it's a very vigorous plant there. Um, I, yeah, color, I, mm, I don't know what to say about it. It just seems to be the how I work, and uh, it's a dominant element of your yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. This, oh, you see newspaper. This is all newspaper, which I started using about a year or two ago. And that's been a lot of fun. I like funny things and and I just like like the texture of it. I Everything is, all the glue I use is Elmer's glue. Everything is very low tech, very uh, un technique, un, un, what can I call it? A basic like stuff that that, <laughs> that you find. This one really references the little bottle with the chair on the right and the and the other chair back on the left and the bottle with the branches coming out. Uh, that was so much fun to do. Um, and I, I do love cutting shapes using the scissors like um, if I may, it's, uh, like Matisse said, uh, drawing with scissors. Um, and and you teach collage too, yes? Yes, I do. I teach collage and mixed media, and I do stress the mixed media part to the students because it's it's such a powerful addition and part of how you can bring materials in and colors in. Uh, right. So this one is called. Um, preparation for a giant still life. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, if my pieces or things in the pieces can make me laugh, then I, I know I'm, I'm on the right track. Not that everything is hilarious and, and funny and fun. It's the paradox is that it's also very serious and deeply meaningful to each of us. I know everyone knows that feeling and but to be able to um, play with tiny bits of things and is kind of what I'm all about, I guess. Uh, this is uh, pen and ink on paper and so some made up flowers in, a, in some oddball <laughs> containers and uh, and then this, this is from, it's a little earlier too, 2017. And, and then I think a, a year later, looking at it, it's, there's so much work and so much, you know, so I do look at things, some I reuse and cut up, uh, but this one I, I painted the background gold and that was very satisfying. Uh, it's called Propeller Still Life. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, and these little ones, th these little ones that that you see uh, interspersed, I do like a, a, I wouldn't say a sketch because I don't know, I don't have any plans to really use them literally again, but they somehow um, are a thought process that's called levitating still life because all of a sudden everything started rising up or I attempted to draw shadows on under them, but they didn't really work and it made the pieces look like they were rising. Um, this is uh, still it's called Still Life with Arabesques, uh, just because it worked out that way, those gray shapes and things that entered as shadows and as background. And they're literally scraps. I mean, I... Hmm. It's just a lot of fun to be able to take things and like this alchemy and make them into these, into something that works and is pleasing to look at. Of course, the bigger paintings, and I have a lot of those bigger paintings, uh, that takes a much longer time and it's not usually as hilarious. And <laughs> um, so this is the outside wall of my space and uh, you can see another gouache that's um, in the center there, those cone flowers. Um, I did take pictures of those and they were already dying. It was autumn and kind of uh, start with pen and ink and take it from there. Um, I think it's called autumn, autumn bouquet. Uh, that's from this year. Um, 
this this one's from uh, 2021 and it was from life and it's small again five by seven uh and i called it big vase and that became um the subject matter for uh these dry points that i did um <coughs> well last year 2022 but this uh very very fun and exciting new direction for me to work with um some of you uh know cindy um and her wonderful print studio so i did the four color dry point myself figuring out as you have to do you know what color goes where and uh cindy ettinger printed these with me and um, that was really a blast really a blast so they're, I think we call them mono prints because they're, each one is a little different. So it's not an edition of prints, but be that as it may. Uh, was a really a lot of fun to take to work from an existing piece and see it change into something else. And this here, the same thing, uh, Cindy made a mistake um, <laughs> and so it wasn't complete it was she just printed the yellow and uh it was kind of upside down so she gave me that piece and i did a gouache right on top of what had been printed in yellow already in the printer's ink so um i couldn't let that beautiful paper go to waste the beautiful paper <laughs> so that's uh gouache and india ink which is something i use a lot and really enjoy Yes, thank you, friend. Thank you. Nice job, Anne. Nice job. And uh, next we come to Susan Sullivan's exhibition. Hello, Susan. Hello, everybody. I, first, I want to thank uh, Mike and Tina for continuing to do the uh, virtual tour and talk um, because I'm out here in Portland, Oregon, so I couldn't um, go to the opening reception or anything like that. So it's nice to feel like you're part of your show. Um, so I lived in Philadelphia for about five years. I moved there to go to grad school. I went to PAFA. And, um, and then I just moved back here about a little over a year ago. And so my work, as you know, when your life changes, your work changes. And so like, um, for a while, I was really focusing on pools, but some other things have happened. So, so this one right here, these were, uh, I mean, obviously they're a pair of shoes, but these were something that like, um, I still had stuff here before I moved um, to Philly. And I, so there were things that I, I got to like revisit again, like old friends, like old shoes that I hadn't seen in like five years. So I went out with them and dancing and they just burst, right? They fell apart on the dance floor. Like as I was dancing, just, I still have them. They're just a mess. And so I was just like, you know, this is what life ha life happens like this sometimes where like, you know, you have something that, that used to have this joy, used to have this life. And then, you know, things crack, things wrinkle, things like break. Um, and, and I thought, well, this is just an interesting thing to paint. I have to, I have to like, and this, so this one is called last dance. Um, so once I moved back here, I started noticing all these like things that people leave, you know, on the street or, 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 um, strange things that are discarded. So, so my work used to really focus on pool imagery. And then once I kind of like had this sort of like, um, change in my life, I started really kind of resonated with this discarded, this, um, um, these things that you're just kind of finding around. And so like this one right here is called Little Queen. I actually really did see a wig on a fire hydrant walking down the street. Um, and I just thought, well, you know, 
it's kind of a happy little thing, right? You know, you see extensions in Philadelphia all the time, like on the street, like you just like hairs falling out of people's heads, like, you know, that they, they, they clip in, but this one was really like, wow, this, like, I don't know where this wig came from, but this, this little fire hydrant got, got a little, like a party. So like, I just figured this party girls out on the street, um, the VCR tape thing, like who's going to who who puts this out? Who wants this VCR holder anymore? And nobody has VHS types anymore. So, well, one thing I did notice that my work started becoming a little more, a little kind of pulling back from some of the bright colors that I've been using before. And like those little paintings are more gray, which Portland, like I said, hey, today it's sunny, but usually Portland's very, very gray, but also very, very lush. So this is very much a typical Portland street. Everything's overgrown. There's just, you can't help the weeds. You can't stop them. It rains so much. But then again, this is another like discarded kind of op object, like this like easy chair, like, you know, and for me, when I see the soft furniture out here, it just makes me a little crazy because I'm like, it rains so much. It's so soggy. It's it's not going to survive out there. It's just going to be this sloppy, wet mess absorbing things like a sponge. And, and who's going to want it? You know, you know, I mean, I understand if you're like, oh, I have this old chair. Maybe someone will pick it up. But it it usually they're just dirty and wet and gross. So like... But this one, when I actually saw this chair walking by across the street from one of my old apartments, I really loved the goldenness of the grass and the goldenness of the chair. And I just thought this is almost like something that just kind of like, you know, sort of popped out. It's not just this discarded thing. It's it's something that kind of like feel it kind of works with this landscape a bit um so uh and it's interesting listening to you other artists talk about like mark mark's really important to me and sketchiness and i i really struggled with that one because there was this one point and we all get this when we're painting that there was this middle part of the painting that i really liked some of the just marks and the sketchiness and I didn't want to touch it. I didn't want to touch it, but I, I even consulted some of my other artist friends and I said, you know what? No, you've got to take it to the full extent. You've got to just let go, you know, and it's so hard to let go sometimes when you like it in that middle part, or you might like fall in love with a corner and I, and I, I teach as well. So like I try to express that to students. This is interesting. This was really like daisies kind of growing out of the street. Um, because, you know, after COVID, we have all these like things lined on the street where you'll have like the rest of the cafe is out in the street. People are sitting outdoors. And this was just one of those things is those daisies just highlighted by the street lights at night. And I, it's just such an interesting thing. And this one's called when push comes to shove. Um, a lot of these, a lot of these um, paintings that um, I've done, it has a lot to do with kind of the emotive things that were going on in my life at the time. So they have kind of these interesting names. They've got more of a backstory that I don't really want to go into. It's too personal. This one is um, called eavesdropping, um, which I, personally love to do. I, <laughs> I love sitting alone in a cafe and listening to what people have to talk about. Originally, I was going to talk about like, why are you talking about zombie movies on a um, warm, sunny day? But because that's what was happening around me. Uh, but anyway, I really kind of loved kind of the beauty of what was happening <laughs> with like, um, the rumpled top of this um, roof. Again, one of those kind of outdoor sitting areas on the street. Um, and I kept thinking of um, 
of demon porn when I was painting this. Like I just couldn't stop thinking about it. Couldn't stop thinking about it. And one, and this was like, again, was one of those things where there was this, there was this time where I didn't want to touch it. I was like, no, I kind of like that it's really stark. And I didn't want to put that gross, moldy, dirty stuff that was um, accumulating on the top of this. And I thought, no, I really just kind of have to be honest with what I was seeing and what it is out here. You know, like there's just, there's going to be like pollen everywhere. There's going to be like moss growing out of something. So I just like, that's, that's really what happens here in the Northwest. But again, a lucky day, lucky sunny day. So I have a lucky sunny day painting. Um, Let's see. What am I trying to... Mike, I need a prompt. <laughs> so here's a pool, right? So how did you get here's into the pool. pool stuff in the first place? Yeah, back to the pool. So this, um, this is a pool that I observed during COVID, um, you know, because I, I did, I was painting a lot of pools, but this one is like, you know, sad, empty pool. Um, and this one, and I paint a lot of things that um, have to do with memory, but then I'll also use like photo reference or I might actually like with those shoes, I paint it directly from looking right at those cracked shoes. Um, so this is really a combination of a, a pool, Kelly's the Kelly pool, but it has a lot to do with this pool that I grew up going to. Um, that was like four blocks away from my grandmother's house. So like, even though I was kind of an observation of a photo I took of this pool, in the back of my mind, I was kept thinking of this Pure Park pool. Like the whole time I kept thinking, this is like the pool that I grow up swimming in as a kid and how sad it is to see it empty. And um everyone has to stay inside and, and what are the kids going to do this summer? So like I, I um, have an interesting relationship with swimming, with pools. I love them. I love swimming. I'm deathly afraid of drowning. I usually stay in the shallow end, um, but I still love to go to pools and go to swimming. This was a, another one and it really works with kind of like the funny discarded. This is a Philly pool. I was just walking down the street and saw this thing. Um, I think it's called Squish or Scrunch or something like that. I can't remember. Um, scrunch. Scrunch. <laughs> but again, it was just like this pool is like, it's not, it's fully formed. Like, I don't know if like kids were jumping on the back bottom of it or something like that, but it was kind of like crumpled. And and for me, it's nice to have like a, like kind of a Philly, um, a Philly kind of house in here because like the landscape in Philadelphia is so much different than the landscape here in um, Portland as far as like what houses look like, what apartments look like, things like that. So it's really nice to like have that. Um, and and I really enjoyed painting this painting. Like I, I, there were times where I was trying to make it a little more realistic and then I kept pulling back and I'm like, no, it's got to be a little more animated. It's got to, you know, um, have, have a little more cartoony life to it. Um, and, and I, you know, I like to play with that, to go a little bit back and forth, like sometimes a little more realistic, sometimes, you know, and and again, somebody else said something honoring the brushstroke, absolutely honoring the brushstroke. I I want this to look like paint. I want somebody to know that I really love oil paint, that I really love working with this buttery medium. Um, and sometimes, like with this one, I think I laid that purple in with a palette knife and then, um, you know, put made all these like, little painted tiles with a tiny brush. Um, this is uh, uh, like a bikini top uh, and it's called B52. And 
it just was one of these things, but I, I like how it's stretched. Like it could be something else. It doesn't necessarily have to be what it started out as. It could be whatever you see in it. These strange like voids of white almost looks like this thing's a bit diseased. Um, I like that too. I like kind of playing with the idea that, you know, life's a little messy, like things happen, like, you know, um, so it, to me, this is a little happy painting, but like those white blotches are a little ominous, I think. And you use a grid for this, these? I, uh, have, um, drawn out kind of lines as sort of gridded with like a, um, a ruler and, yeah, like you can see with this, you can see a little pencil mark in here. Uh, my mark making with these tile type paintings kind of evolved. It went from like, I would put some graphite on there and then I didn't like how things would smear. So I stopped doing that. And then I would just kind of, I would paint like sort of like white grout lines with like a um, almost tinted white to get the... Um, the grid and then it started being like sometimes I just eyeball it sometimes I just kind of sort of like try to do my best measuring just like painting one on top of the other um more pool imagery so as, as you can see so like these things are a little bit older but they're like they're much brighter they're like I love saturation of color I love working with students and helping them figure out color and talking to them about color this was a pool that I um in New York and it's the silliest pool because it's only three feet deep so it's one of those pools that you just sit in and have a cocktail and it's like for me it's like What's the point? Like, it's like, you can't really swim. You're just going to sit in that. So it was always kind of funny to me that um, there was this pool, um, but there, the color and the, and, and I, and I kind of loved this like weird little like grate that you would walk down like the three feet um, into the pool. And that's, it was at the Dream Hotel or something. So I think it's called the Dream. This is, um, this one's like really kind of wild to look at if you're like in person because those, those, that, those bathing suits just going to pop right out at you. And um, let's see, I'm trying to remember the name of this one. Um, this um, Malibu. Which one's this one? This one is Malibu. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's funny when I started painting a lot of, even though I was in Philadelphia when I was painting some of these pool paintings, I have this idea of what light looks like in California. And I don't know if it's from visiting family or something like that. But a lot of times these things, I would have these things in my mind and I would think about, oh, well, this is what the light's going to be like. This is what some woman on a really hot, sunny day is going to wear. This is the bikini she's going to wear. Um, you know, while, I, you know, I'm freezing in my studio, I'm thinking of like someone like walking down the beach um, in a bikini or something like that. But yeah, I don't think I'm going to totally divorce myself from like pool imagery I think um I think it'll come back you know things like like you guys talked about your work things kind of sometimes retreat sometimes called come back this one's called broken valentine um and I really did start painting these tiles um I think the day after valentine's day not this year the uh, 2021 or 22, sorry, 2022, because there were some life events going on and I just knew that I had to kind of express what was going on, um, in my heart. And so this one is actually not a bathing suit. This is actually like lingerie. This is actually like a bra. Cause I was thinking like, what really like, you know, what, what's, what's covering my chest most of the time is this and like but it's like I 
I wanted the um, image to be sort of like, you know, like you tore apart somebody's heart. So that is um, broken Valentine right there. But I love that it's paired with this other piece. This is Chevron. Um, and this is a painting I did when I was still in Philly. And I had just, you know, you get inspiration from everywhere, right? Like sometimes like, I mean, I really love fashion. I really love looking at fashion magazines. So I saw this pattern on somebody's dress and I really just kind of like, it was really the pattern of the colors that I was saw. And I saw, okay, well, I need to use these colors. So as you can see, so I have grout lines in this one. This is more like grout lines. While the broken Valentine, the lines are a little more free from form. They're not like completely symmetrical. There's like, there's a kind of a, some space in here and like the rib cage area. Um, but this one, I really was like, oh, I, I really want to see what I can do. Um, with this patterning, because I'd been looking at um, a lot of like patterns and tile. I, I, I look at a lot of like, you know, tile that you'll put in your, in your house, or I've looked at a lot of like tile that they put in like pools, like the bottom of pools and things like that. Um, so I was really interested in, in how you, if you work with a pattern and, and I was really loved these colors that I had seen. And then I had this like, I really, when I, when I look at that Chevron one, I realize that most of my, I guess they're sort of stand-ins, most of my bathing suits, they're almost all female because that's what people kept giving me um, was um, female type bathing suits. But I really wanted something that was almost more of what um, a man might wear, you know, like more you know, like in Europe or something on the beach. So that was in my head, this was um, a man's bathing suit, not a woman's bathing suit. Thank you, Susan. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, next we have Leslie Fenton. Hello, Leslie. Hello, Michael. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for hanging the show with Gina so beautifully. I appreciate that, as always. Um, okay, so the work in this show um, continues and extends an exploration I've had for some years now, um, working with paper. Um, I use paper and a very limited palette of ultramarine, burnt umber, raw umber, titanium white um, to um, sort of find ways to mimic the motifs, patterns um, that I find in the natural world, uh, specifically in this case around water, rocks, um, and typically in more overcast, suppressed light. Um, let's see, we'll see here. Uh, these are very um, labor intensive pieces. Um, these smaller ones, uh, let's see, where do I even begin? Um, like I said, I sort of, I spend a lot of time observing, drawing, um, taking photographs, and just internalizing imagery that um, is sort of distilled from what's what I'm experiencing at the moment. So I try to um, limit and distill, uh, like in this case, these sort of striations these, um, that can represent Read forms, those same forms can also, or those same, same markings, I should say, can also represent things like um, stratified raw, for example. Um, I like working with the limited palette um, and limited materials because I think that through limitation, 
I can find a way to a virtually infinite um, exploration and expression of a wide range of, um, of experiences. This piece we're looking at right now, um, which I called um, night bathing, um, it's sort of a poetic compression of crustacean forms, broken. Um, I, you, you can see in this one, and it's more prominent in other pieces, this, these sort of concentric circles, which I came to use to represent, um, I mean, it can be, you know, shell-like forms, but also, and we'll see in some of the other pieces, these concentric circles can represent tree cross sections, um, as well as star tracks. If you see time lapse photography, um, you'll see that um, you know time lapse photography of, of star tracks in the sky. They are sort of circular because of the rotation of the Earth. Um, I find it very compelling and very interesting as an artistic endeavor to um, find ways to um, use particular motifs, like I said, to sort of represent different things in different contexts. Um, so um, like here, this piece was sort of a way of going from the schematic to the almost somewhat more realistic, like fully embodied um, life, um, sort of forms coming from the darkness. Um, there are a couple pieces in this show that are older. This one in the middle is uh, an older piece, but I felt that they kind of informed and almost were prototypes to some extent for the pieces that I'm working on now. So this one I called um, Last Seconds of a Shell. For me, it, it is evocative of um, time spent in Maine, the sort of hills, sort of human scale, low hills one sees um, in an overcast sky, imagining a shell that is, you know, undergoing a process of sort of um, disintegrating. Um, Let's see. Um... How do you put your pieces together? I mean, do you do you use like rag paper? Do you make the paper? Do you paint it ahead of time and then cut it? Or I start with pot and linter. I start just with sheets of white porous paper, thick porous paper. I use them. I sort of excavate. I I carve them. I infuse the white paper with pigment. Um, I mix a color. I put it on a piece of plexiglass and I infuse the paper with that color. Um, that becomes, I, I sort of think of it as a matrix. I'm creating a matrix from which to create um, an image. So, uh, and this is a perfect example actually of that process because I was trying to hover um, in a realm of close values and have some light pop out from objects, entities, creatures that are emitting internal light. And then, um, but that's all within the context of a sort of dusky, suppressed, um, you know, um, evening light, say. Um, and again, you see the circular forms. In this case, they sort of evoke, um, this is called wetland in the half light. So uh, sort of a pond, um, pond disturbance, um, reeds, insect blow, you know, sort of dusk, dusk light. So how did you evolve to working this way? Did you start out like as a painter and... I started out at the Academy of Fine Arts as a painter. I started um, sort of affixing paper to my canvases and became more interested in 
the malleability of the paper itself, less interested in the, the sort of gridded canvas and um, felt, began to feel that this was where I really wanted to explore a kind of shallow relief, almost like a, a shallow sculpture, let's say. So these pieces, they read right to left horizontally. They're, they try to create an illusionistic pictorial space. And they also um, suggest compression of time and space through the, I would say compression of time through the, um, the layering, the, the, the physical layering. And then your titles are very specific. Yeah, somehow I just lost you. I don't know what happened. Oh, wait a minute. I guess it was just the, hold on. I think it was just the laptop. I, I spend a lot, I like words. I, I, I am an editor by day, or I used to be. I, I'm actually retired and do some freelance editing, but I, I have always liked words. I'm married to a playwright um, who loves words as well. And uh, I take great care with my titles because I think they, they sort of, um, give you a way. I, I want to give the viewer a way into the piece without telling them exactly what to think about it. Um, and uh, so I think I think words are materials like um, like pigment, like paper. They have qualities, specific qualities, and I find it really a uh, like a, an interesting and useful exercise to kind of come up with a title that um, that is informative in some way and also you know kind of lingers with you but doesn't um, again doesn't sort of tell you exactly what to think about what you're seeing. So this piece was I sort of finished this up maybe last for the show this is Winter Matrix um, I'm always interested in, in um, you know, like hunkering down into a setting where there's, um, again, the overcast light, um, sort of a sense of snow, um, but there's always life going on within that. And um, I was sort of trying to capture some of that with this piece, um, with all the layering and, um, there, again, there are a lot of kind of, you know, crustacean forms. Here's an example of the concentric circles sort of um, occupying a different <laughs> role than they were in the, um, you know, the tree cross sections. But you can see it's very labor intensive. I use an X-Acto knife. I use the reverse side of the X-Acto blade for scoring because I don't really want to cut the paper. At that point, I just want to score it and create a topography for receiving the pigment. Um, I um, will go back after I've pressed the paper, the, <laughs> the topographied, shall we say, paper into pigment. Then I'll go back in with a blade and cut, peel away. Um, I, I like the idea of revealing a light beneath the surface of something. And I think that's sort of what goes on in winter, you know, there's stuff going on underneath all the time. Um, um, again, a lot of these, I spend summers, um, several weeks each summer, a couple of weeks in Maine. Um, this, we were staying at, um, on the Narrows, um, which is it's a tidal area. Um, and uh, we were sort of kayaking through. So this piece, which I called In the Narrows, um, you can see the, uh, all the striations and scoring. But um, the other thing that that does, the striations and scoring, it creates a sense of scale um, for the pieces. It, it gives them a level of detail that I can work back into. And um, again, more scale than, and, it helps to sometimes create a more monumental feeling um, by using that. Um, this one, tide rack, it sort of felt like where we were, the, the tide receding and revealing um, the sea rack and um, sort of 
crustacean rock forms. Um, And then this piece I called epical sea in the sense of epics, like geological epics. Um, I sort of felt like we were in this piece uh, kind of traveling across time. It sort of compresses um, uh, both, again, moving horizontally across the piece and sort of down through the piece, through the layers. Um, um, compressing time um, and um, sort of things going on in the ocean. So again, there's sort of this sense of there's there's sort of um, an energy that sort of spins off into um, life forms, let's say. Um, this one piece I called Sky Fragment, um, sort of this idea of, you know, I had this landscape and I thought, you know, that'd be kind of interesting if a fragment of the sky sort of fell down. Um, but again, I, I spend a great deal of time until these things actually ripen. I try to um, have a sense of accretion and complexity and yet still have a particular image that emerges from all of this. Um, this piece I called a crumbling. Um, again, sort of the rock faces, striated um, forms that kind of extend up into the sky. Uh, and this sort of feeling of a, a sort of moment of crumbling. That's about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, are there any questions for Leslie or any of the artists? All right, well, if not, we'll call it here. Um, thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you to the artists. It's great to, oh, great to hear you <laughs> speak. Um, as I said, the show's up through March 12th. So hope you can check it out. If not, you can see everything online. And uh, I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. It was great. Yeah, I love seeing everyone's work. And so different from each other. That's what's really nice. Yeah. So, kisses great. to my kisses to my friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kisses to my friends. <laughs> we could mix them all up. And yeah, kiss, kiss all of you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, gang. We'll see you. Have a great night. Thank Barbara, you. thank you. We'll talk. Thank you.